I just got back from a mini tour with my band and it was such a big reminder that very rarely does everything go perfectly when you're out on the road or playing shows. Even though our tour was amazing, there was all these little surprises and little things we were walking into on a daily basis that weren't what we expected. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about how you survive that tour on a daily basis. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY DIY (laughs) Musician Podcast. Welcome to episode number 311 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner and joining me is Chris Robley. Chris, how you doing? I'm great. This is one of my favorite topics, touring, but also things that can go wrong. It's so fun to discuss all the little unexpected (laughs) nightmares and hiccups. So I'm excited for this one. Yeah, we're going to title this one Live Gigs, Thrive survive or die and we're not talking about physical death we're talking about maybe (laughs) psychological the the fading the fading light of your musical (laughs) ambitions and career after going out on the road or like one of the anecdotes i'm sure i'll mention in this the breaking up and dissolution of a band immediately following a a terrible (laughs) gig on tour oh yes yes as mentioned at the opener just got back from a uh, a mini tour with my band Small Town Poets, it went great. It was so much fun. It was amazing. However, I came back from that thinking about this, the experience of how many variables you're walking into every day or how many unknowns or things that you have to react to and deal with and how you are positioned mentally and even physically in some cases to handle that, all those, you know, last minute changes or issues or things that pop up, how you, how you mentally are prepared to handle it can make or break your tour. And so yeah. we're going to talk through some of those things because I think it's a big part of the touring experience. Yeah. Just one thing to uh, say about it. When you came back from the tour and we were discussing it, I forget if you did four or five shows, but it was like, oh, these are all very different kinds of shows, which also means very different kinds of things can go wrong or just be unexpected. <laughs> yes. But puts you off your game in a way if you're, you know, not approaching it with a little creative mindset or preparation. So that kind of made it fun to talk about this stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll dive into all of that. That's coming up in a minute. First, uh, I want to remind you to subscribe if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever, YouTube. Please be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. If you're watching on YouTube, a thumbs up would be appreciated. And there's a notification bell that makes sure you see the latest episodes. I can tell you, Chris, I think all these social platforms, they're all the algorithms seem to be going crazy lately because like, I subscribe <laughs> to a bunch of stuff on, on YouTube that I never see. Probably the majority of followers I have on Instagram, I never see anything by them. I'm seeing stuff by random other people that says, maybe you might like this. And so it's important to subscribe and hit notification buttons to make sure you're notified when new episodes come out. Yeah, There is still time to make plans for the 2022 DIY Musician Conference, which is happening August 26th through 28th. We're in August now, Chris. That's it's weeks is, away. It's weeks away. It's, str- it's a struggle even... <laughs> Imagine that we're that close. It's in Austin, Texas. You can get your tickets at DIYMusicianCon.com. Also, the hotel block is almost sold out. This is the big discounted rate we get for attendees. So stop, push pause right now. Go buy your ticket. Go book your hotel room so you can get that discounted hotel price. But there's a couple things we wanted to highlight beyond that that we think are important for you to know. First off, if you had thought about going to the conference maybe in May or June and you looked at airline tickets, you might have thought, heck no, no way I'm paying that much to go to Austin. In fact, Chris and I and Christina, who was on the last episode of the podcast, we were all going to go back to Austin in June, but tickets from Portland were $900 to $950 round trip. No other options. And so we, we canceled that trip. However, those ticket prices have come way down where right now from Portland, you can get a plane ticket to Austin, even this close to the event at 270 round trip. 
So if you looked in the past, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, at the beginning of summer, the airline rates were exploding. They have come crashing down in some territories. So if that was a reason that you just passed, maybe check into that again, because you might get a screaming deal right now. Yeah, I fly out of Maine, which is kind of a small airport. So I've usually got two connections along the way to anywhere I go. And flights can be on the more expensive side for your average within the U.S. flight. And I got my ticket, I think about two weeks ago to Austin, and it was cheaper than it normally would be on, you know, any other year besides this one where oil prices have skyrocketed. But it seems like with flights, they've gone way back down. Yeah, I, I know that they there was issues with the airlines, with capacity and all that that was driving prices way up. And now as the travel season starts to, the summer travel season starts to come to a close, I think all those tickets are going back to their normal price range. So double check in that. If that was a reason for not going, I just wanted to highlight that I've been following the airline tickets for weeks and weeks because we have to buy about 30 of them to get our staff there. And so $900 and uh, Versus 300 is, is a huge difference, difference for, no. for all the tickets that we buy. So also, this is big. Chris, the schedule is now live and it is amazing. When you look through all the topics, I am so excited. There's so many things that I think I, I would say are out of the norm for a conference. We've got the good marketing stuff, but there's just so many other interesting sessions that I think we haven't covered as much. Yeah. Well, I posted it last night. So if you want to see it, you can go to the DIY musician blog and the full schedule is there. And as I was looking through it before posting it, I was like, wow, this is very balanced there. Like you said, there's marketing stuff, there's performance stuff, and not just about you know, how to play an instrument better, but there's vocal coaching that I think he's going to get Matt Ramsey. You'll get people on stage to do singing workshops. There's how to sort of dial in your tech. If you're playing to tracks or doing live looping, Tom Jackson's doing his live makeover. And that's just, you know, one side of it. There's just so much stuff. Yeah. 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 I got a session on my screen right now. It says these beats ain't free from DIY to Dre. This is led by Justin Rhodes. It's an award-winning music producer. And also, I mean, because that's one of the topics we've been asked to talk about on the podcast about selling beats and how beats work in the marketplace. So I think that's going to be a great session. Damon Grant's going to be doing one about getting the gig and keeping the gig. like As a know, side guy side, side or person. session yeah. player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the strategies around that. And I think that's important because, you know, most musicians who make a full-time living from their craft are diversified in that way. They're playing for other people. They've got their own projects and they're touring. There's just a lot of things that you can do to drive up revenue and playing for other people and understanding the opportunities there is a good one. <clears throat> this one I mentioned from Alberto Chapa. He, he is a um, Able, Ableton certified trainer and he's a producer, but performing with tracks, using technology to enhance your live shows. I love this, the idea of this session, and this is one that I'm absolutely going to try to make. And I say try only because I'm actually working at the conference. And so some things <laughs> pop up that dictate that I don't get to do what I want to do. What you want to so, do, right. <laughs> if there is a metaphorical fire that I need to go put out, I will miss this session. But I love this because it also plays into some of the conversation for this episode. But there's so many great sessions like the ones we mentioned, I'm trying to find the one about having a career and a day job. Um, oh, that's Matthew Mayer's session, I think. Yes, yeah. Uh, I, I don't forget what it's and, called, but... Yeah, that one, I saw him post online about it, and a lot of people were interested, and I think that's going to be a great session. So lots of topics. Of course, there's all the marketing topics. There's all the release strategy topics, <clears throat> but I just wanted to highlight some of the ones that I think are interesting that are in the mix at our conference that you don't find at other conferences. Also, we have all the keynotes, which we talked about on our preview. Those are going to be great. I'm just really excited as it comes together. You know, we've had so many challenges this year with getting a late start, still the uncertainty with COVID, then we've had inflation and travel costs, and it just feels like a huge victory to actually execute this thing <laughs> and the content be as good as it is. Yeah. So super what? excited 
about it. I, I wanted to also mention just sort of outside of content, just the, the ability to meet and learn from reps from a lot of brands that are going to be there. So absolutely, Spotify, I'll probably forget a bunch, but Spotify that will be there, you know, representing Instagram and Facebook, Pandora, Amazon Music, YouTube, Berkeley, show.co. You know, the, the list is very long. And then speaking of YouTube, they're going to sponsor a Saturday night event, which is going to be really cool. It's half curated showcase and half open mic, which I think is great because all of Friday night is going to be a, a super fun open mic. But then that kind of spirit can continue into Saturday night as well for people to put their name in the hat. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Sound Exchange will be there. Pandora, Amazon Music, Chart Metric. Co-signed. Uh, yeah, yeah. co-signed and more are coming in on a daily basis. There's a few more recording type gear companies that I can't say because they're like on the bubble, probably coming. But anyway, lots of great people there that you can meet in person. It's such a accessible environment that it makes it easy for these conversations to be had. I found that Matthew Mayer session. It's called, can I be a musician while also working a day job? So I think yes, that's going to be a good one. He'll he tell can. you how. Yes. He's going to give us the answers and we need answers. So again, head on over to DIYMusicianCon.com. Get your tickets. Tickets are 179 right now, but they will go up to 199 after August 18th. August 18th is the last day you can buy tickets online. After that, you have to buy them at the door for 199 So get that hotel locked in, get your ticket locked in, and we will see you in Austin, Texas. Any other words about it, Chris? It's going to be a blast. See you there. <clears throat> yeah, it's going to be good. All right. <clears throat> Let's dive into the topic at hand. So you mentioned at the top, the top of the show, Chris, that there were the little mini tour that we did. We played in four different states in four days. So I called it the four states in four days tour or something like that and had a little graphic made. It was fun. But the thing that was interesting to me was that, like you had said, each day, it was a different type of show. So the first day was a club show. The second day, it was a church, but it wasn't a church event. We just used their auditorium. It was like we rented a theater, basically, as a you know blank slate. Hey, we're going to have a show. We promoted it. We did all the work for that. Then we had a house show, which was amazing. And then the last day was a city gig, you know, like a city concert series where every week in the summer, they have a band in the park that they promote around big events. So very different day by day. And so every day we were walking into different situations, different gear, different challenges, and just the challenges that you deal with within your own band and all that. I just thought this would be an interesting discussion for the podcast. Yeah. And you legitimately had surprises at the venues every time that was like, oh, this is a great discussion because you had to do some quick problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, the first day was a club in, uh, in St. Augustine, Florida. It's called Cafe 11. Actually, if you're looking for gigs, that's in your one of route through Florida. That's a great venue to check out. It's nice sized, meaning it's appropriately sized for independent artists. It holds in the configuration they usually have shows in, it holds about 110 people because they have cafe seating. But we sold it out. It was packed. But there's also the situation of like, hey, this isn't an empty club all day that we can just show up and sound check for hours on end. You know, the working around people, their uh, lunch service and like, oh, well, we got to wait for that. Oh, now we only have a window of time before the dinner service starts and yeah and and all that kind of stuff so there was that then there was the venue that the the church had amazing sound and lights but the sound nobody could figure out how they routed it all because they didn't have an analog board it was like no, layer and no. layer of digital menus right yeah yeah and then the house show was you know where we were trying to adapt like we got there and we actually had more gear and ended up doing more plugged in than expected and it worked really well and the city gig we got a picture of the sound system and it was a head with like 11 channels, three of them like being stereo channels. And you're like, this 
is not gonna cut oh, it. Oh boy. This is not this is not gonna cut it. And we told them at that in advance, but it's also like realizing in that particular case, we're dealing with people that work for a city. They're not music mm -hmm. promoters. And the things that you're trying to tell them, it's not computing to them because it's you're like that doesn't mean it's anything. A different language, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that gig as well brought up, wasn't that like 104 degrees and you were in the sunlight? Yes, it was it was in the 90s and extreme humidity. The heat index was like 104 and the stage was facing the sun. <laughs> That's and one of those gigs I would maybe be on the verge of just saying I'm not doing it, which we should do as part of this episode is say, which of these problems would we yes. live with or uh, or quit? <laughs> yeah. Fix it or live with it, uh, it or, or, or yeah, quit or quit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, that one had all sorts of challenges. Um, fortunately we got there and they actually had us playing on a different stage with the tent over top. Originally we thought there was going to be no cover, which we would not have been able to play because our gear would not have worked. It would have fried some things. So yeah. So coming off of that, just this whole variety of things. So we put together some lists of, of, things that you just have to have some like mental preparation around that you might be walking into before that we get to that list though two things i would say one part of the reason why i was thinking about this and thought that it's an important thing to talk about is because most people are rehearsing in a practice room that the environment is very static and it's usually dialed in the way they like it or they expect a certain thing and they're used to it and so you play your show and, and then you just think magic's going to happen on stage because you've poo-pooed everything Tom Jackson says about having a show planned. But then you get to the show and reality hits and you are facing all these mental challenges. And then you're expected to do the show where magic's supposed to happen and it just doesn't happen. That's usually how things go. And that's why, one, I think it's so important with like what Tom Jackson talks about and and having a show put together and having moments built in is because that way you know what you're going to do and you you can fight these mental challenge these mental battles easier during the show. Well, uh, it's the, it's mus uh, it's muscle memory essentially yes. performance muscle yes. memory that's so dialed in that you go to it even when the sound sucks and the lights broken and you're sweating and your amp is literally on fire like <laughs> the, the show must go on and and that kind of preparation helps. Yeah. The other reason that I thought it was interesting to talk through is that some of these things might be in what, you know, a lot of artists have a, a concert writer. So you book a gig, you work out the, the, the fee and the, the basic arrangements, and then you send a concert writer, which is with, has all your, your specific needs, whether it's your band layout on stage, you know, the kind of beverages you want. It can get wild and crazy, or it can be, you know, just the basics, you know, this is what we expect as, as a part of this agreement. But some of these might be addressed, but not in the same way. Because also sometimes you have these things in a concert rider and you show up and they didn't do it anyway. So you have to just adapt with whatever the situation is. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think you kind of said this when you refer to the Tom Jackson thing. But I think most musicians assume they're prepared as long as the musical material is prepared. Like we've practiced, we know our songs, we're good. But no, you you should somehow practice all this other stuff at least mentally. So yeah, yeah. Because the thing you know, I've always found when playing shows, the difference oftentimes between a good show and a mediocre show or a great show and a mediocre show is like your mental state going into it. Because if a broken cable or a distracting fan is going to knock you off your game that badly that you can't perform well, which if you've performed a lot, all those things will happen at some point, mm -hmm. then you realize that those things have just taken it. It's so easy. Those things can just take you out of it. But really to me, the great performer is someone who's understood how to, manage all those stresses as you're performing and be able to still give a good performance uh, yeah. because they're expected and you have sort of a game plan. So that's what this, this checklist we're going to talk about. First up, 
the sound system. And obviously we all have dealt with sound systems and issues of trying to figure out a sound system. But one thing that I found on this last tour that I think was interesting and maybe a blessing and a curse is that so many places now have the same. There's a couple boards that are out there. One of them's the X32 that a lot of clubs have. And that's great because they're digital and it's the same board, potentially feeling like you have the same gear on tour with you night after night. However, all these digital products can have so many screens and layers for people to jack up and screw up that you can spend hours troubleshooting just how to get the signal to flow properly because... Where if it was an analog yeah, thing, an analog, say, yeah. it's this fader and this button and now they've got the cable plugged in wrong. Problem solved. Yes, which happened to us at one of the places where it's like, oh, this should have been the easiest sound check ever. We walk in, we plug in, and away we go. We had a separate board on the road with us for in-ear monitors. So every day, regardless, even at the house show, we were able to, to do monitor how we wanted. So we had our monitors taken care of, but yeah, we spent all the way up until 20 minutes before the show was supposed to start oh, troubleshooting because there were just layers and layers and layers of screens of signal routing. And until we could find there was an issue where the click track was coming through the house and it should not have been. <laughs> and anyway, that was a huge issue. And so that's something that I thought, you know what? A lot of people, yes, you run into issues with the sound system night after night, especially playing clubs or with different venues. But you can also run into a situation where you think it's going to be easy because, oh, this is the same board we're using everywhere. But unless you know how these things work and work, you could be troubleshooting and having issues that weren't expected. Well, I, I have a bunch of points I wanted to run through on this list. But before that, I'll ask you the, the fix it or live with it question about let's Let's imagine you hadn't been able to fix that issue of playing to tracks and you you know the click was just coming through the house can't do that. Are you guys as a band prepared to play without tracks? Like could do you have a set rehearse where there's no Well, what we would have done <laughs> and let me tell you my blood pressure was rising like crazy because when because we don't get to play as much our tracks also have guide stuff in it that tell you where you're at so it'll say chorus two and then count in and chorus you know bridge and so you know where things are at and when you're learning a, a big set of like 30 songs and aren't as rehearsed as you'd like that's very helpful <laughs> so now okay so to any of so, like the old jazz snobs who i can hear being like that's cheating hey jazz snobs remember you read charts it's yeah. they're basically doing the audio version of what you do. So it's true. That's true. So, so anyway, the drummer would have still heard the click and, and played with it. But the thing that makes me get nervous and we would have gone with it. We were about seconds away from going without it until we, uh, a light of, a light of hope opened up and we figured it out in that situation. My big concern is the drummer forgetting that I can't hear the click and there's multiple spots in various songs where I'm the only one playing. And if he doesn't keep that hi-hat going, it will crash and burn. But that, that was my biggest concern. Plus, I like hearing the click. All right. But we would have gone without it. You could have done it without it. All right. So you would have you would have lived with it if you had to. Yes. So here's my sound system issues I've encountered. Showing up at the venue and there are too few inputs. So like you're saying, it's a it's a board where... Maybe there's only eight inputs and oh look, two of them are taped off because they're broken. <laughs> and you've got you've got a four or seven piece band that have to make do with six inputs. And there's a lot of things you could do. Okay, maybe we don't all need vocal mics. And when we sing harmonies, we'll do the eighties thing of crouching up on one mic. Or maybe, okay, maybe the guitars don't get mic'd and you just turn them up. I don't know. There's a lot of things you, yep. I I have lived with that one plenty of times. I also have the benefit of being able to do my songs alone. Like if all things came crashing down. So it could always be a solo show, which I feel like has saved me a few times. I should also caveat. I've played many great shows with amazing sound, pro sound people, all good. But I've showed up at gigs thinking there'd be a sound person. And they're like, here, you're doing sound. And then you're like, by my, like for my own show. Oh crap. 
which sucks, but I'll live with that one. Then there's the one where you show up and the sound system is provided mostly, but then you realize that like, oh, we don't have mics and cables. You guys were supposed to bring those. And you're like, no email or website told me that, which is why I always bring a box of mics and cables. So I'll live with that one. And then uh, I guess the last one is sort of what I asked you about. Just if, if you can't play the tracks, but you can't, what, what are you going to do about it? Can you yeah. do a stripped down version? Yeah. No, I think a lot of it to me is like understanding the plan B, what happens if this? And so you've sort of walked through some of those scenarios in your head. When you were reading that list, when you, you said the sound system's incomplete, bring your own mics, cords, and stands. And that reminded me that a lot of times venues will have their gear list on their website, but don't expect that to be right. <laughs> who, knows, <laughs> who knows when that was there or how much of the, the, the sound system's been stolen since then. <laughs> or as, as bands, you know, tip themselves with an extra microphone on the way home or cables and... And, you know, like if you're playing clubs, it's like like you mentioned, the the channel that's out, the the mic cable that's broken. You're just, you know, you don't want to show up with way more stuff than you need night after night because that becomes a hassle to load in and out. But having an understanding of like, here are some critical things that tend to go wrong. The one that, well, I think the sound system and and just in general, the, the audio experience is getting a little bit more challenged is be in like what you said, relying on digital tech. We played a show in Seattle a few years back with four other bands and we were the only band that had a drummer, a live drummer. Other people were just using their laptops for drums. And, and I'm not talking about like loops. I'm talking about like, it was just like. Just playing to, to digital drums. Track, and I'm like, but it was this is drum. Weird. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that if that's what you're doing, what happens if that doesn't work? Do you have a plan B? Because you might want to figure that out. Can they not figure out how to get audio into the house? Or is it noisy? Or is there issues? Anything can happen. So having a plan yeah. B. E uh, one last point about this. like Even as a solo performer, I will rely on or use vocal processing stuff, looping stuff, vocal harmonies, what else? Like a little kick pedal. Like I've got some bells and whistles to to make the solo performance not just to do with guitar. But if those pedals broke or the sound system wasn't functioning, I still need to be able to just be a guy with guitar. And so I think if even if you're in that kind of mode of performing, practice a set or, or your, you know, practice your songs so you know you can still do an interesting version without any electricity at all, you know, imagine a campfire and can you make that entertaining? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the venue a little bit because that I think is something that night after night can be a, a mental challenge. You can have an, a venue where the, from the moment you walk in, you feel so welcomed and appreciated and you're just like, wow, this is amazing. I'm just happy to be here. And you can also walk in where they seem disinterested and upset that you're there, even though you're booked. Somehow yeah. you're a nuisance, even yeah. though they're a music club. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the weirdest thing. Like you um, chose to run this business, turn it into a restaurant. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. So you can run into the, and it seems to happen a lot at music venues. Like there's just a wide range. So that can just throw you off your game if you walk in and someone's feeling a little confrontational a little put out that you're there things like loading in and loading out can be an issue all sorts of stuff can come up that that you don't necessarily get through in advancing the show and are just dealing with day of yeah that ba bad attitude i can remember there was this one club in idaho i was touring through and I got the distinct feeling that like they had bands. I think there was two bands or maybe three bands on the bill, but they wanted us all done at 10. So the DJ could set up because that's when the party started and they made all their bar money. I was like, just have the DJ for longer. Why are you going to like have three bands and treat us like crap and then rush us out the door? Anyways, on the venue trouble list, I mean, parking is one thing. Where can you load in? is there room for, you know, one time I was in San Francisco with a sprinter. That's not the easiest parallel parking and double parking to load in. So all those sorts of things, is there a backstage or not can be a big consideration if you're used to being able to sort of escape and unwind and have your own space. A lot of times 
it's a very different experience to just be in the club with your audience if you're not used to it. So, yeah, that's something we experienced with that first show on this run. It was a club, a small club, cafe type setting. It was packed and there was no area, you know, for us to kind of regroup and mentally connect before we played. And that's something that, you know, I hate taking the stage where it felt like we were all just scrambling around randomly and just happened to get on stage at the same time. It's like, no, let's, let's find a place to intentionally connect, especially when, you know, that show, there was a lot of people we knew coming to it. And you're like, that always adds extra challenges, mental challenges when you have a lot of friends at a particular show because they want to hang out and you're like, I'm, I've got to go do a show. This is like, <laughs> I've got to go do a job. <laughs> yeah. They have expectations and you feel like you're shirking them. Yeah. One other mystery is, you know, will the venue deliver on any promises they have of like drinks or food? Is it a mystery? Do they, you know, do they make it clear what you can put on the tab right up front? Another thing is set times, you know, venue, just because it's a quote music venue, that could mean you're starting at seven or 1 a.m. Like huge differences in, in just, you know, what you're going to have to do. The last thing I had on the list here was dealing with promoters that aren't promoters they may not understand the issues and concerns you're raising. And that's the, that city gig we did uh, when they showed us the sound system. We're like, no, no, that's like, uh, I've got a better sound system for the dance parties. I throw in my garage. <laughs> that's not <laughs> sufficient. And it became clear with the back and forth that we were having with them, that they just weren't understanding what we were talking about because it doesn't mean anything to them. It it's like, that's a sound system. It has enough inputs for you. It's like, no, that's, this is not sufficient. And it, 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 it was one of those things where you're realizing, oh, we're dealing with somebody who's not a promoter. It's a city thing. It's their job to, you know, book the bands. And I don't know if you remember this from like, maybe it was in the nineties. Like if you did a, like it would be at churches or like college lecture halls or, or, or like a, a, I don't know, a public city podium where like, if you had to play music, the person would be like, oh, do you have a sound system? Well, we have a podium with a mic. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, that's what someone speaks into. There's speakers built into the ceiling that, that <laughs> you can hear wherever you are in the room. Just, just saying, if all the band can just <laughs> gather around the podium, we'll be good. I don't know if that, that happens anymore, but. I'm sure it does. Maybe not as often, but. The last very obvious thing to say, but it probably should be stated anyways about venues is the type of venue really determines the type of music you're going to have to present. So house concert, you got to go into that knowing that volume is a real concern. Outdoor event, maybe not so much because volume is what's needed to reach people, you know, in the open air, late night punk rock show, whatever the environment is, it's going to set the expectations for what you can, what you can and should do with your music. Yeah. And being flexible is, is key. Like we did a house show and we made the call to be more plugged in than we probably would normally have done, but it was basically so we could do more music and basically do the set we had been doing and it ended up being great. But then the outdoor city gig, we needed to throw in some more music and we had some covers and also realizing that it's not going to be a, a start to finish show. It's going to, we took a break in the middle because it's so dang hot. Uh -huh. But yeah, all those things can dictate what you need. And so going back to that city gig, they booked us for it was a two hour slot. And again, they're not concert promoters. So they're assuming that we know certain things, but having played a lot of shows, we knew, hey, we're going to have to fill this time. It's not going to feel like a normal gig. We need to add some songs. We need to put in some breaks and just really understanding that the client in this case doesn't know all the details to give us because it's not their area of expertise. Yeah. That's one of those shows where it's like, you're providing a service. It's not art. It's not a concert. You're, you're providing a service to the city. But yeah. What do we have next on the list? Oh, uh, the breakdown of the body and mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think one of the big things that people don't anticipate when they go on tour, especially tour, like if you're playing a one like one offs once a month in town, that's it's not as big of a deal. But when you're on tour, just 
the fatigue and grumpiness that sets in both inside yourself and amongst your, your crew that's on the road with you. And if you're not prepared for that, that can be a real issue. In fact, the one thing that shocked me when I started touring, like right out of college, because I just all I wanted to do was be on the road and playing shows, because I thought that's what everybody wanted to do. And it, how cool is it to be on the road playing shows? I was shocked to see how many amazing musicians, when they actually toured for real, just lost their mind. Like, I cannot do this. I cannot handle being on the road. I am out of here. So it is mentally taxing. And there's a lot of fatigue. And if you're not prepared for it or understand when it's happening, it can really cause a lot of problems. Yeah. And one of those problems can be sort of interpersonal between how the band is functioning in a way, like not even musically, but I'm thinking of a time on tour when one of the people in my band got pretty ill. And suddenly there was like this consideration where normally you play a show and then you hang out for a while, you network, you meet the other bands. Yeah. You hang out with the fans, whatever. It's it's a it's can be a late night activity where you're investing. Maybe you're drinking, maybe you're partying, whatever. But part of that is because it's it's networking in a way. And yet yeah. this person's illness, when they were well enough to play the show, but then felt like hell afterwards. You know, there's an expectation, reasonably on their part, that now we have to get them to a hotel or someplace to sleep, and it's sort of interrupting the the the, the rhythm of touring in that yeah. way. And then I think the next night they got even more sick. So then we got into that territory of like, oh, can we play without this person? Which is a whole other thing. As long as it's not the lead singer, maybe the answer is always yes, but you have to be prepared for it. I don't know. But we, we went on. We, we got a hotel room for them, their own hotel room so they could rest. And then even we drove to the next city and did two gigs and came back to get them. But, it, you know, it's a whole interruption of the rhythm and sort of efficiency of band touring. Yeah. Yeah. If you're on a long tour with another band, it's not a bad idea to learn their songs because we've had that situation where we were on tour with somebody and their keyboard player got sick and couldn't come out on a run. And so our keyboard player did double duty and played their set too. Ah, <laughs> so so nice. you never know where you might need to jump in and it might be a way to make a couple extra bucks on the road too. Well, it, it's ahead. a low sleep environment too. So even if no one's getting like all that ill, it's like, you're just grumpy. And why the hell is the driver playing that damn album again? I'm so sick of that music. <laughs> Will he shut up? You know, like you, everyone's just on their worst, even when their bodies are mostly fine. Well, and also you're in such tight quarters with people that that alone can be challenging at times. The one thing I was spotting on this, this short run we did was that keeping it together when someone's having a bad day. There was one day where one of our guys was like pretty frustrated with some things. And you're like, come on, we got to shake it off. We got to go do the show. It's going to be great. The people will have no idea about any of this. And so let's just go be professional. Then the next day, somebody else, it was like, you could tell was not having the best day. And I think it was just they were tired and it's recognizing and trying to, uh, you know, help them along in that process <laughs> that a lot of times you're not sleeping well. Like we had a, a, we had a sprinter bus and the AC in the back didn't work very well. And we, had, we only slept through the night on it one night and it wasn't a very good night's sleep. <laughs> and so everyone's grumpy. And so there's those kind of things that you just got to recognize and have like a plan. All right. I know that this person, when they get this way, it's they just need rest and space. Let's give it to them and and figure it out. We'll, we'll go on. They still have to do the show. But I mean, you know, understanding that those things are going to happen. Everybody like leaves tour going, yes, we're going on tour. Then this whole mental, physical decline <laughs> happens as oh. you're playing shows night after night. And just recognizing it and having a plan with how you recognize it in others and deal with it. Yeah. And, you know, I can't claim to have always been the best at this, but just like pretty direct and open communication. Like I'm grumpy today. I'm tired. So I would request that whatever I need this after the show. Do you mind if I go backstage by myself and chill out? Whatever. Like there's ways of compensating for one another, but you kind of have to be upfront about it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Communicating around that is not a bad idea because you are living so close to people that the little irritations that you might experience in day-to-day -day life where you might go seclude yourself or 
just lay low. It's hard to do in that environment. And so people can start lashing out at each other pretty quickly. <laughs> Although small town poets, I don't think we've ever had like a legitimate argument, like where people are yelling and screaming. Oh, um, you should fake one and film it. Yeah, we should. We should. No <laughs> one would believe it, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what's next on our oh, list? Oh, we have outdoor shows listed. So, oh, my least shows. favorite gig. I know. I know. Every year when we were touring, I used to think, oh, it's festival season. I get to play shows with our friends and and see other bands and and don't have to play as long. <laughs> That's only 45 minutes instead of an hour and a half. And then I remembered, but they're outside and it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. Everything sucks about it. I mean, not always, but the acoustics are terrible because not only are you not in your element, but neither are the sound people and the gear that they are accustomed to using usually indoors can be very different. You know, the way you decide to mic something could even be yeah. different outdoors. The heat, the cold, the way that sound just like, escapes into nothingness instead of like bouncing back in a nice acoustic way. I hate yeah. outdoor venues. Yeah. It, it's crazy how it sounds like you're playing to nobody. I've played on some massive festival stages. And when I stepped, the, it, the one I'm thinking of, I didn't have in your monitors, but I stepped away from the monitor and there's these, you know, giant structure of speakers hanging in. It felt like nothing was coming out of them just because there's no room to reflect anything back to you. It's just the weirdest feeling and experience but this is where i think the the fix it or live with it or maybe cancel it <laughs> might come in that show that we did in 90 degree weather 104 heat index if it had been the the original stage that it was going to be on which was built into the park we probably would have had to cancel the show not only because it would have honestly been too dangerous from heat exhaustion but um our gear probably wouldn't have worked. And that's one of those things where I think as far as mental preparedness, a lot of uh, our artists are using laptops and iPads and, and various synthesizers and keyboards. And I have an amp modeler that runs all my sounds. All those things cannot take sitting in the baking sun. You can not only risk not being able to do the show, but also risk damaging your gear, having it sit out and heat like that. So that was one of those things where we were very concerned whether or not we'd be able to play the show. You know, if it'd been 70 degrees, no one would have thought about it. But when it was that hot, that's something where you're like, man, we might be in a situation where we have to pull the plug on this. Well, it also, it, it becomes an environment where you need to think of all these extra little things to potentially bring to make it manageable. And one, I was just thinking of, let's say there is an awning or a tent or something over you, but it doesn't completely block everything on the stage. Now your effects pedals are just a little bit in the sun and you can't read your LED, you know, like, <laughs> so if you can't read what your pedals are doing, that creates an impediment. So do you need a little thing to create shade? Do you back them up? Because that could be a moving target too. You back them up and then 20 minutes later, they're in the sun again. That do you need fans? Should you have sunscreen on? Do you need to wear sunglasses? Like, if it's cold, you know, it's the opposite problem in a way. You got to have extra layers and your fingers even work when it's that cold. If you're a good, you know, a string player, guitar player, <laughs> horn player, your lips freeze off. There's just so many strange little environmental concerns. Why on earth do people like outdoor shows? Because they really are the worst <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> I, when you were saying the fix it or live with it or fix it, I think outdoor shows may be the only one where if everything was going very poorly, I would say, I can't do this. I'm done. Because two reasons, I don't find them all that rewarding. But also, if everything broke and I had to just be an acoustic player with a guitar shouting, well, that would work in a theater with good acoustics. It would work in a small venue, but I can't do that outside. No. So it's like the more things break down in an outdoor thing, the more I'm inclined to just be like, I know I'm going home, which I don't think I've ever done, but I can imagine myself doing it. Yeah. I, I think if you're planning an outdoor show and a, a lot of them that we end up as independent artists playing are oftentimes booked like I this gig we did. It's somebody at a city we're putting on a concert series and they may know something about music they may not they might just be person that was assigned that task just ask some questions like what what direction does the stage face is there shade is there natural shade 
where we ended up playing, there was a tent over us, but it was in a field with not an ounce of shade. And so we were covered, but the audience was not. That's a challenge. So I think there's some things you can ask and try and figure out in order to help make sure that those kind of gigs don't end up becoming the nightmare gig. If you follow me on Instagram, I put regular posts up about it, but I, I put a picture on stories where I was just drenched. I, I had never, that. I'd never sweat, had, had sweated like that before in my life. And I know people say that kind of stuff all the time. I've never done this. I have never sweat like that. It was a mess, like just dripping everywhere through my clothes, everywhere it was so hot. And the whole time I felt great. We took a break and I downed like two bottles of water. And I, I, at the end, I thought, man, I feel surprisingly good for how hot it is. And I feel energetic. But then while we were tearing down and getting ready to go grab some food, my head started hurting. Suddenly, my nose started running like I was having some sort of allergic reaction, even though I've been in that area for all day. So it's not like I discovered any new, <laughs> encountered some new plant or anything. And, and then I started to feel nauseous. And, and fortunately, I got to a place and cooled down. But I think I was experiencing a little bit of heat exhaustion. Um, because it was so dang hot. So those things are real and you got to take care of yourself and understand that, you know, you can get yourself in a situation where it's just not worth it. Um, mm. that, that I, I'd never experienced that before. And it, and once we got to the restaurant, it was freezing cold in the restaurant. Plus all my clothes were still wet. <laughs> so it, I went to, once I cooled down, all those symptoms went away. Uh, yeah. so that's something to be aware of and just be careful with. It's interesting. This, this is a little off the topic, but you mentioned something about the audience not having a great time if they're exposed to the sun on a hot day. That reminded me like about venues. One of the things you can't account for is like the surliness of the audience, right? <laughs> like, um, you know, is there a regular in the bar who is there every night? So he feels like he can be a complete asshole and he doesn't like your kind of music. So now he's, sh you know, heckling you. The audience is kind of out of your control. All you can do is try to wow them and keep trying and keep trying. And hopefully eventually you do. But if you don't, that can be one of the biggest, you know, head games to get into is like, these people hate me. Now they're being vocal about hating me. I think there's <laughs> only like, one time I can remember really getting heckled by a guy and it threw me into a bit of a tailspin as a performer. And I was like, I can't do that again. I need to need to get thicker skin. Yeah. I think that's one of the interesting things when you start playing night after night, especially if you like, if you're doing a longer tour and you feel like we're just in a groove, we've got this dialed and people are liking it. And then you get this random show or you could get a series of shows where you're doing the exact same thing and the people just aren't responding. You get people that are distracting and um, like the blues brothers throwing beer bottles. And <laughs> I've, I've never had I've, that, but <laughs> I've had an issue where someone was spitting on me before I, you know, wow. uh, where uh, they really hated your guitar solos. It was a little kid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he just hated the guitar. I was, I was playing and I'm like, uh, you know, there was a bunch of people right up front by this stage and I'm playing and I'm like, did, I felt like something just hit me. Like, did something just hit my face? Oh, uh, what just happened? And then I look down and there's this little kid sitting like almost on top of my pedal board, just spitting at me. <laughs> wow. How did you deal with that? It was one of those things like, this is what it's like to be a rock star. <laughs> people spit <laughs> on you. Oh. <laughs> Nasty. Uh, yeah. Then we have one more section of like other artists dealing with other artists on tour can be a big thing that takes your head out of the game. Ba their bad attitudes, this competitiveness, especially around like sound checking and time slot, you know, everyone hates that band that, you know, it's like they're getting the one, one more song indicator from the, the crew and they play three more, you know, yeah. and then they go way over their set and it feels like they're just, sticking it to you, screwing you over for your set changeover and your set. That can be a real take you off your game. Yeah, there's, um, there's so many like personality types that it, this could really go a thousand ways, but like it could be that you yourself really just want to impress this band because they have a reputation or they're they're cool. And they may be perfectly nice, but you just are feeling insecure about yourself yeah. because of what they represent to you. Or it could be the opposite. Maybe they're super cliquish and they are not very friendly. And now you're like, oh, these people hate me. Do I suck? Like, 
Yeah, that's always it's, strange. And, and then then it could be the situation where you're you've got a good opening slot, or maybe you've got the headliner slot, but the band before you, it's like it's packed, and you're like, this is exciting. We're gonna play for a bunch of new people. The venue's packed, and then that band's done, and the venue clears out, <laughs> and everyone leaves. <laughs> that could what? be so defeating and really throw you off your game because not only were you excited, but there was energy in the room that just completely evaporated. And now it feels like you're, you're playing in a museum compared to a rock show. Yeah. I, it's tough not to blame the band for that too, because it's like, Oh, they didn't make enough of an effort to keep their fans out. Why, why are their fans like that? But um, one other thing about insecurity, I was talking about like wanting to impress the band, the, the other band that's there. But it could be the case that they go on stage and they're just better than you. They're like amazing and they go first and they rock and then you have to follow it. And you're like, well, how do I, what do I do now? Uh, yeah. Well, you have to do what you always do as best as you can. But one other thing I have seen is when bands have meltdowns on stage, it kills the mood of the whole night. Like I, I was in LA, we'd driven there. It was the first gig of our tour. And the band, I think, was either just before us or two bands before us. The The lead singer was literally yelling at his bandmates and basically saying, like, you're embarrassing me. How are you doing? You're screwing this up for us. Like, you could hear his whole conversation on stage. And meanwhile, his bandmates were fine. Like, he was the one screwing up half the time. But now it's just this awkward thing for the rest of the night. Is like, oh, we watched. And that was the band I was mentioning, like, after that set, like they broke up in the parking lot and we could hear the whole, <laughs> we could hear the whole argument. He was firing them while they were quitting at the same time. Like that's awesome. <laughs> so bizarre and like just childish. Like they were so, probably back together the following week. <laughs> man, we forgive. We love you, man. Um, and then the last unforeseen thing, I guess, is I've played gigs where bands on the bill don't show up for whatever reason. And I've been asked to, you know, cover some of the time. So you got to be ready to potentially step in in that way, too. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's a lot of stuff. The last thing I have on my list here, vehicle issues. Your vehicle will break down. You better have a plan for that. <laughs> Get AAA, know what, it ha what you need to do. If you've got a bigger vehicle, understand what is needed to tow something like that or the kind of service places you need because it will happen. It's a part of touring. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter if your vehicle's new or old. Touring puts stress on them that they were not designed to go through for that many miles every day and you will break down. So if you don't have a plan or understand maybe the quirks of your vehicle, like the kind of things it needs or where it can be serviced, you better figure it out because you don't want to do that in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska, <laughs> <laughs> which oh, I lot. have, we have done before. Back in those days, we barely had cell phones. And so we would just go play wiffle ball on the side of the highway <laughs> until triple A showed up. So somebody figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> We would have to flag down truckers at times, you know, to get them to see, you know, use their radio oh, to radio wow. somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good old days. I didn't you know. tour before the cell phone, so I don't know about that. But I know what it's like to break down on a Sunday in a small town and have no auto mechanics even open to then you miss your Sunday gig and maybe your Monday night one. Yeah, it's no fun. It will happen. And you can't plan for when a breakdown is going to happen, but you you know that making sure your vehicle is serviced, but also understanding how to, to handle those issues. The other thing is, is your gear will break and cables break mysteriously all the time. So have an action plan of like, OK, if I'm in the middle of the set and I break something or something's not working or we're in sound check and it's all stressful because something's not working. How do I go through the plan of troubleshooting? Because oftentimes people are just like running around with a like a chicken with its head cut off and, and not really having a plan of how to troubleshoot their issues. And this is why I hate it when you go to a venue or you have a band member who has just a mountain of cables. No matter what they do, everything turns into a a, a big cable a spaghetti snake thing. Den. Because you can't troubleshoot in that situation, not effectively. So having a plan for all that. 
Chris sort of Aver one last thing that that I have okay. encountered a lot that is out of your control. You show up at the venue and you realize they don't have a proper stage or they have no stage, and you are now <laughs> supposed to set up in the corner or in an alcove, <clears throat> right next to the foot traffic of their people that are there to drink and not to see you, or their wait staff who then are coming by and knocking into the boom mic all the time. And suddenly <laughs> the mic hits your teeth and now you have to visit the dentist. So uh, see, that's, that's why I'm not a singer. I, I just can't lose these front <laughs> teeth. <laughs> well, I don't know that what you do in that situation, how you prepare, I guess in my, I just stay hyper alert during the set. Yeah. But you know, I know some people who will just move their mic back and then like put chairs around it or tape off. I always feel like that f seems a little uh, pretentious. walled off or Stand pretentious. Stand or off -ish. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but no, it, like that's definitely a thing where like, you're not even a venue. Why are you having a squeeze in the corner? But you'll put together a concert rider if you're touring a lot and you'll be advancing shows and you'll talk to somebody and they'll say, yeah, you'll be on the stage. And then you get there and you're like, yeah, that cement space in the corner. That's our, <laughs> we call that the stage. I'm like, you said there was a stage. That, that's what we call the stage. That's, that's it. it. That's it. And like, that's not a stage. We are not speaking the same language. <laughs> or the stage is like big enough. It's like eight by eight. Yeah. You're supposed to fit your whole band on it. Yeah. So I don't know that I have a hot take, but after going through this <laughs> and they always talk about how you know the number one way bands make a living is by being on tour you know <laughs> i look at this and go this is the worst possible job the worst <laughs> possible way to make a living <laughs> it's like every day is chaos <laughs> if 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 75 percent of it goes right it's a huge victory <laughs> so anyway I, I hope I hope you enjoyed that discussion and I hope it's useful and and fun, but also the idea of like surviving or thriving on tour compared to just surviving, feeling like you're flying by the seat of your pants or to feel like it's all coming crashing down and and like, why am I doing this? Uh, a lot of it is just being mentally prepared and and thinking ahead to the situations you're walking into and having a plan on how you deal with it and maintaining that sense of professionalism that a lot of it is just a mental state you gotta mm -hmm. force yourself to have a way to deal with these things so it doesn't throw you off and it just become the worst day of your life and that's an exaggeration but at the time it feels like it. like it's terrible taking the stage and feeling completely exposed and vulnerable sucks because it's bad enough as artists because we feel that way normally every day about everything but then when you feel like it in the physical sense and how things don't feel right and you have to take the stage and deal with it, that's challenging. And you need to have the this plans in place in order to make sure you stay in the good space. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't have a, a technique or a strat, whatever, a plan to get back in that good headspace, you run the risk of making it the audience's fault or problem or make it seem like you're trying to blame the audience or the venue yeah. or the sound person. And like the minute you start scapegoating things in the room, you've lost not just the night, but those people will never come back and see you. Like whenever yeah. I've seen a band get very just cruel to, to either the audience or the sound person or the bartender, or whoever I'm like, I, I'm done with you. Or act so. pissed that they have to do the show or like, yeah. this sucks. Or you can tell they're having a bad night and you're like, it's going to, at minimum, it'll definitely impact your merch sales. So yeah. that's why you got to, you know, the difference between a, a mediocre night and a great night could all be in your head. And so I guess my final thought would be, our drummer said that this was a quote from Fred Armisen. However, I Googled quotes from Fred Armisen and I could not find it. But anyway, Fred basically said something like, it doesn't matter if you're playing to a handful of people or a huge audience, the fact that you get to take the stage and play music should make you smile. And so basically the idea that you should look at every opportunity to play is, you know, this is something special that musicians get to do that very few people on earth will ever get to do is take a stage and play music for people. And it's challenging. It's tough. But just reminding yourself that this is awesome. I get to do it and I'm going to enjoy it as best I can. And, and that's how I sort of positioned my head as I was taking the stage for that one show that the, the sound gremlins went all the way up until almost showtime. It's just like, hey, we fixed it. Just shake it off. 
<laughs> the fact that I get to play with these guys another night is amazing and awesome. And I'm going to enjoy every second of it as best I can. So here, here, there you go. All right. Well, if you have a question or comment or a scam email or, or want to weigh in on how you're surviving being back out on the road and a lot of those things that maybe you forgot about the ups and downs, the daily trials and tribulations of being on tour and want to call in and weigh in, you can do so. The listener line is 360-524-2209, or you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. And we love those scam emails. We haven't had like a good scammy one in a, in a bit. So we need one where it's just ridiculous over the top. <laughs> but send it on in. And we love getting your calls and your emails, and we'll get them on the show. And I think we have one episode left, Chris, before we take a break for the DIY Musician Conference. So we'll have a, one more episode, and then there'll be a break, and we'll pick it back up in September. <laughs> yeah, after we've rested. Yes. So Thank don't you. forget, get your tickets, DIYMusicianCon.com. Get your tickets to the conference. If you were worried about travel prices and that kind of kept you away, check it out again. It could be that those airline tickets are a screaming deal now. There's still some room in the hotel, but not much. And you can still stay in the hotel, but you won't get the cheap rate. And it's going to be the place to be. It's going to be so good. I can't wait to go. Hope to see you all there in Austin, the 26th through the 28th. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. See you in Texas. All right. Take it easy. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.